The inaugural issue of the New Thinking Aloud magazine was just released on March 1st. You can download a free PDF copy from the New Thinking Aloud Foundation website. Thinking Aloud Conversations on the Leading Edge of Knowledge and Discovery with Psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. And I'm Jeffrey Mishlove as well. You could think of me as Jeffrey's dialogue partner because this in-presence monologue is actually a dialogue that I'm having with myself. The topic I'd like to address today is the universal chakra system. What do I mean by that? Well, to begin with, I should warn you, viewers, if you're looking for a discussion that is empirical and based on modern science, this isn't it. This is speculative, this is cultural, historical, and metaphysical. But what I mean by the universal chakra system is something akin to what the yogis and the great scholars of ancient Hinduism have called the Purusha, the universal person. It's not necessarily the same as, as a deity, but the idea is that if there is what uh, we call mind at large, a greater mind, that our consciousness exists only because we partake of some kind of mind at large, some kind of larger consciousness, because it's not generated by the spikes of electrical activity passing through the neurons in the brain. That might generate information, that might generate a sense of uh, processing and thinking, but it doesn't generate pure awareness. In my way of thinking, that comes from somewhere Else. Now, there are many scientific speculations as to what that somewhere else might be, and I'm not going to get into them right now. What I am going to suggest is that this larger mind could be thought of as a person. And what does it mean to be a person? Well, one of our best definitions, metaphysically speaking, of what a person is comes from the chakra system of ancient yoga. Uh, as I've pointed out in previous monologues, and actually I think it goes back to my conversations of decades ago with uh, the great mythologist Joseph Campbell, the chakra system of ancient India encompasses many different Western versions of psychology. For example, the sexual chakra, the second chakra, the Svadhisthana chakra, corresponds with Freudian psychology and the dominance of the id, the sexual drive, in psychological theories. And the same is true for each and every one of the seven major chakras in the chakra system. It represents what you could think of as a level of consciousness. I'll go through these levels briefly just to point out what I mean. The root chakra, the first chakra at this base of the spine is associated with the desire to acquire, to have, to own. You could say to be tight-assed in, in some sense, to want, to possess, to communicate, to accumulate, to have a nest, to have a nest egg. These are very basic human desires. And we've talked about the second chakra, sexuality. The third chakra, located in the solar plexus area, is associated with the will to power. There's quite a bit of uh, both philosophical and psychological writing in that area. The heart chakra, of course, is love, altruism. The throat chakra is the ability to communicate. 
The third eye chakra is mentation, but mentation now, as I pointed out, is different than consciousness, pure, unadulterated consciousness. I think of as being associated with the seventh chakra, the crown of the head, the thousand-petaled lotus, our awareness of infinity, of the absolute, of the, the oneness of everything, the interconnectedness of everything. And yet, of course, consciousness is much more than just oneness. And that's where it gets very, very interesting. Now, I'm going to hearken back for a moment to the work of William Tiller. I first heard Bill Tiller speak at a symposium in I think it was probably 1973, uh, sponsored by a now defunct organization called the, Cat the Academy of Parapsychology and Medicine. They put on a wonderful symposium at De Anza College in Cupertino, California, and, and they brought together many interesting speakers, including Andrea Puharich, about whom I've spoken in the past and probably will have a lot more to say about him in, in the future. But one of the speakers was William Tiller, and he held up a chart at the time. Now, before I tell you about the chart, let me say a little more about William Tiller. Tiller is a very distinguished scientist. He was chairman of the Material Science Department at Stanford University and subsequently done some interesting work. I'm uh, putting up one of his book covers so you can see his uh, work in psychoenergetics. Now, I can tell you this, the parapsychology community has never embraced Tiller's work. They considered it far too speculative, but he was a very highly credentialed scientist. And at the conference in Cupertino, sponsored by the Academy of Parapsychology and Medicine, I'm sorry they no longer exist, he put up a chart showing the seven chakras and he used the term transducer. He said each of these chakras functions as a transducer. In other words, it takes this mysterious energy that is coming from mind at large and it grounds it in the human organism. These various aspects of consciousness from communication, love, mentation, the, the will to power, the will to altruism, the sexual drive, the will to accumulate, all of these things. I think it's fair to say that these are human qualities. Let us suppose that there is another conscious species on another planet. I don't know that they, if they had chakras at all or anything equivalent to chakras, would, would they be like ours? Supposing that these are eight-limbed cephalopods like octopi or, or, or something of that sort, what would their chakra system be like? It's hard for me to be sure. But I think it, that some of these qualities are universal. Procreation, acquisition, the, the urge to power, the urge to love and altruism, the desire to know, to think, and the openness to the absolute. All of those things seem like qualities that transcend merely being human. But just for the record, I want to point out that my friend Charles Upton suggests that there's actually something very special in the human form. And it may be why the Hindu tradition, you have Purusha, the cosmic person, represented, well, not exactly human. It represented as what you might think of as the essence of all conscious beings. Look at this diagram. It's suggesting the, the multiplicity of conscious possibilities all in one being. And this being represents not necessarily the ultimate deity, Brahma, uh, but represents the possibilities in the world of consciousness itself. 
back to Tiller's model. The idea of a transducer it suggests that this energy that we bring into our organism through the chakras has to come from somewhere. And one might say that that somewhere is, in fact, the universal chakra system, the chakras that belong to the cosmic Purusha. You could call it the cosmic Christ. Uh, also, in uh, Western esotericism and the Kabbalah, there is this notion of Adam Kadman, which is also the, the universal Adam, the universal person. Now, in Kabbalah, instead of the chakra system, you have what's known as the tree of life. But uh, there are so many parallels between the chakra system and the tree of life that I think the same principle holds. That the idea is that the tree of life is embodied in the human organism and in the cosmic person. Interestingly, I began thinking about this in relationship to the previous in presence monologues, monologues, dialogues that I have discussed in recent months concerning what I've called the return of the PK man, the idea that my old friend Ted Owens, who died in 1987, has been reaching out to me from the afterlife, and I'm trying to make some sense of it. One of the big controversies among scholars who look at the whole question of the afterlife is the idea that what is it that persists? If William James, for example, used the term a cosmic reservoir of all knowledge, but it doesn't imply necessarily the survival of individual personalities. And yet, of course, of course, we have data that individual personalities, at least on occasion, do survive and reincarnate. So, uh, we can't exclude the idea of human personalities, but we don't necessarily have to embrace it in every single case. I can tell you right now that I'm not convinced yet that Ted Owens has, in fact, reached out to me from the afterlife. I'll be completing my report on that. Today it happens to be the 22nd of March, 2023, when I'm recording this. And the uh, experiment I'm running with Ted Owens is, is going to take me some weeks to completely analyze. But for the time being, I can say that I haven't yet seen anything that's overwhelmingly convincing. And on the other hand, uh, curious as I am, I'm not about to discount entirely the possibility that this might be happening, even though I don't have what I'd like to have, solid, concrete evidence that I could base a, a, an opinion on. So, I wondered to myself, well, after all, maybe it's some kind of uh, manifestation of William James' cosmic reservoir. And I began thinking of this cosmic reservoir as being an amalgamation of all the sentient beings that have ever lived, all of their memories, all of their wants and desires and impulses and skills, all embodied. And, and then, as I began thinking about I could connect, I can tune in, I can understand that this cosmic reservoir is a part of who I am. And of course, it means that it's a part of who you are as well. But at the same time, that something seemed a little bit overwhelming and dissatisfying about that thought. Like, imagine billions and billions and billions of, of beings. It's like overwhelming. There seemed to be, in, in my thinking about it, no organization, no structure. And that's when I thought of the idea of the universal chakras, the idea that this consciousness that we all partake of, it may not be the ultimate God consciousness, or it may be even larger than what we think of culturally as the ultimate God consciousness, because the seventh chakra and its access to that pure oneness and pure infinite awareness 
well, that's one of the seven major chakras. Who knows how many minor chakras there, there may be? I know there are many different systems of chakras. Some even include hundreds. But the point being that it's organized in a sense. There's a way in which I felt I could interact with this larger consciousness of which I am a part by resonating with it chakra by chakra. Now, it is at this point in the conversation that I want to refer you to a meditation. It's available online. I'm going to link to it right now. Uh, for those of you who are able to click on this link in the upper right-hand corner of your screen, it'll take you right there. It was recorded decades ago, back in the days when I lived in California and, and was uh, working with my friend Arthur Block to produce the original New Thinking Aloud. No, the original Thinking Aloud series. This is New Thinking Aloud. And the reason I bring up that exercise is because it is a chakra meditation amongst other things. It's also a meditation that takes you out into the depths of outer space, into the far reaches of the universe. But it just had never occurred to me back in the days when I made it that the chakras that are within us are also within the universe itself. And that's what I'm positing for you right now. So, I'm going to leave you with that thought that the universe, the universal mind, that mind at large of which each of us partakes, we are like drops in the great cosmic ocean. But it's not exactly an ocean. It has chakras and we can resonate with it chakra by chakra by chakra. That's, that's my thought for today. So, I want to thank you for being with me, and I want to thank you for being with me too.